So after this video lecture, students are going to be able to understand uh, the determining factors associated with acid-base strength. Um, students are going to know uh, the strong acids and bases, and they'll be able to relate acid and base strength to specific conjugate acid and conjugate base determination. Um, and finally, students will be able to use and understand calculations using um, Kw at specific temperatures and in pH conditions of 7.00. So let's go ahead and let's talk about acid and base strength. So listen, acid and base strength is determined by the position of the equilibrium for the dissociation of a specific acid or base. So basically, the ionization process that your acid or base is going to go through, the degree to which it goes to the right is going to dictate the strength of your acid or base. So if we look at the dissociation processes here, we have hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. So hydrochloric acid is an acid. It's going to break up into H plus and Cl minus ions. Okay, now these ions that are present, obviously the more product we have present, the farther to the white right our equilibrium is going to lie. Okay, so if we were to look at this with respect to an equilibrium expression, we would have a Ka um, expression or equilibrium expression. That looks something like this. So the more products that I have and the less reactants, obviously the stronger the uh, acid is going to be. Um, in that same thought or that same vein, sodium hydroxide is going to disassociate into Na plus ions and hydroxide ions. And the more products, again, that we have present, the uh, stronger that base is going to be. And again, if we express this using an equilibrium expression, we would end up with something that looks like this. Okay, so again, the farther to the right your uh, equilibrium lies with respect to this, these ionization processes, the stronger your acid or base is going to be. Okay, now something that needs to be noted is that the strength of your acid or base is not related to concentration. Okay, so it doesn't matter what the molarity of your solution for that acid or base actually is. All that matters is the relative equilibrium position um, that will be achieved uh, for that specific acid or base. Okay, so HCl and sodium hydroxide will both be strong acids and strong bases um, respectively. Doesn't matter if they're concentrated or dilute. Okay, now we have talked about the equilibrium position being um, the determining factor for strengths of acids and bases. So strong acids and strong bases, we've already given the example that the equilibrium is going to lie far to the right. Okay, and therefore um, you're going to mostly have um, your ion products, okay? And so what we say for um, strong acids and strong bases is that they're going to ionize 100%, okay, in solution. And basically, you really won't have much of your original acid or base present in that container. In terms of weak acids and weak bases, your equilibrium is going to far, lie far to the left. And so what that's going to mean with respect to your um, substances present in solution, okay, is that really you're going to have mostly your reactants and very little um, products, okay? So if we were to look at HF, which is an example of weak acid, um, the reality of it is is we're going to have mostly um, HF present, okay? The concentration of my HF is going to be greater than my H plus and my F minus, um, respectively. Okay, so there's going to be more of your reactant than the ionization products. Okay, so um, something else that needs to be mentioned uh, sort of quickly is what we see down here. Um, the weaker the acid, the stronger the conjugate base. Okay, so when we start talking about acid and base chemistry, um, what you guys need to understand is that the products that are produced, um, their relative ability to behave as acids or bases um, are potentially going to alter things such as pHs of solutions and, and things of that sort. And we'll talk about those things in detail when we move on to um, our next units, but I just want you guys to go ahead and kind of keep that in the back of your mind for when we discuss uh, additional concepts. Okay, so back to what we were talking about in terms of um, strong acids versus weak acids, what they're going to look like in terms of the species present at equilibrium. Okay, so for strong acids, we say, say that that uh, strong acid is going to completely ionize into H plus ions and chloride ions. Okay, so before ionization, we're saying we only have HCl. After ionization, we're going to say we have 100% of our H plus and our Cl minus. Okay, so the reality of it is is that what we expect to see is only the presence of H plus and Cl minus. 
Um, why? Because that uh, strong acid is going to ionize completely. This same concept applies to strong bases. The difference would be obviously that we have hydroxide um, and some positively charged ion present uh, in uh, large concentrations. Okay, now weak acids on the other hand, guys, remember we said before ionization, we're gonna have just the HF. Okay, and then at equilibrium, notice we're gonna have some H plus, some F minus, um, but we're uh, going to have a whole lot of HF still present. And that's because, remember, equilibrium um, lies farther to the left than to the right, so only a small quantity of ionization is actually gonna occur. So we're gonna have um, both our original acid and just a little bit of our ionization products present at equilibrium. Okay, so same would be true for a weak uh, base. The only difference, obviously, is that we have hydroxide and, again, that sodium ion. Okay, so guys, I want you to be thinking about and visualizing what's happening in these particular problems. Um, notice that you don't necessarily have the species that you would anticipate um, because, obviously, it depends on whether you're dealing with weak or strong acids. So... What are strong acids? What are weak acids? Okay, so guys, listen, this is a nice, beautiful chart. Um, what I wanna point out here, guys, are these strong acids here. Please memorize these and know these. Um, if you know there's strong acids, you can basically assume, hey, most of the other ones are going to be weak acids. Okay, so memorize these, spend time with them. Okay, and so what we're saying is that these strong acids, they ionize 100%, okay? Um, hydronium ion uh, is basically uh, another way of representing Remember that H plus ion, okay, um, and we'll talk about that here uh, in a little bit, um, but for now, just, just understand that that's basically H plus. Of course, uh, you may want to look around, okay, you have your acetic acid, you have water, okay, so their relative positions on this chart are kind of important, okay? Now, uh, you know how we talked about the fact that if you have, say, a strong acid, you're going to have a conjugate base that's going to be weak, or if you have a weak acid, its conjugate base is going to be stronger. I want you to kind of notice how this chart works, okay? So in the case of strong acids, the strength of the conjugate bases produced are very uh, low, okay? And for weak acid, the conjugate bases that are produced have um, very high base strengths, okay? So understand this interchange here. This will be important for later, but um, for now, just make sure you know your strong acids and know the relative position of water and such in this chart. Okay, so let's talk a little bit uh, more detail about acids um, and the various types. So we have polyprotic, oxy, organic, um, and hydrohalic acids. So polyprotic acids, guys, are going to be acids that have uh, more than one H plus to give away. And the primary example of uh, a polyprotic acid that you'll see commonly is H2SO4. Okay, so this is sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid can ionize, obviously, to H plus, as well as... Um, this ion here, okay, so this bisulfite ion that has um, basically been generated from this initial um, ionization process also has an H plus present. Okay, so if we were to look at the second ionization process, okay, um, we end up getting this and our sulfate ion. Okay, so uh, this ionization process, right, so this is our first ionization and this is our second ionization. Now, something that you guys kind of might want to keep away or keep in the back of your mind is that um, typically your first ionization is going to be your strongest, okay? And then any subsequent ionizations of H plus ions are going to get weaker and weaker, okay? Um, and we'll see that later on when we talk about calculations associated with polyprotic um, acids, but just understand that sometimes acids have more than one uh, H plus that it could potentially give away. So if it only has one, uh, H plus to give away, we'll call it a monoprotic acid. Um, it has two, diprotic, okay, triprotic, okay, on and on is how it could potentially go. But polyprotic is the generic way we represent these. All right now, let's go ahead and talk about oxy acids. So, guys, oxy acids are actually pretty common. Um, and in these situations, they have their acidic proton attached directly to an oxygen atom in the molecular structure. So, uh, phosphoric acid would be an example of an oxy acid. Okay, and if we go ahead and uh, draw out this structure here, okay, what we end up with okay, is kind of generically this. What I want you guys to notice here is that we have three hydrogens that are attached directly to oxygen atoms in the molecule. Okay, and so what ends up happening here is obviously we have um, three potential locations to remove protons, right? And uh, this is facilitated by the electronegativity difference here. The oxygen here pulls electron density towards itself, so it makes it where these 
um, H's are more easily ionizable. Okay, so um, there are plenty of other examples. Um, hypochlorous acid, nitrous acid, these are all examples of oxy acids. Um, but what you need to understand with oxy acids is that the oxygen, uh, the hydrogen is going to be directly attached to an oxygen in the molecular structure. Now, organic acids are a unique type of um, uh, oxy acid. Acetic acid is an example of one of uh, the organic acids that you guys have interacted with. So in this context, guys, um, notice we have an oxygen attached to, sorry, excuse me, a hydrogen attached to the oxygen in the molecule. Okay, so this is going to be our uh, acidic proton. Um, now in this case, there is something called a carboxyl group. Okay, so um, basically the presence of this double bonded O, okay, um, and an additional oxygen here uh, with a hydrogen attached to it is what we refer to as a carboxyl group. Okay, so in this case, um, this oxygen uh, and this oxygen both pull electron density away from this H, making it where um, that hydrogen is more ionizable and more likely to go into um, its H plus form. Okay, so basically these are usually weak acids. That's something just to kind of keep an eye out on. Um, but uh, they're very common. This kind of structural uh, component is very common in organic acids. Okay, and then of course the last examples are the hydrohalic acids. Okay, so HF, um, HBr. Okay, so basically you're going to have a hydrogen attached to a halogen atom. Okay, so now that we've talked about strong um, acids, let's go ahead and talk about some identifiers for strong bases. Okay, so basically hydroxides of any of the group 1A or 2A metals are going to give us strong bases, are going to behave as strong bases. So we put them in solution. Um, when they dissolve, they will ionize completely. Okay, so um, group A, 1A uh, hydroxides, they completely disassociate. They're very soluble in water. Um, so they, you know, basically as soon as you drop them in the water, you're going to know your concentration of your hydroxide ions. Okay, now when it comes to 2A hydroxides, um, they're dibasic bases. That means that obviously they have two hydroxide ions to give away. Now, they don't always dissolve very well in water. Um, and because they have a solubility problem, um, you don't necessarily get that complete ionization. Um, however, what does dissolve will actually ionize. Okay, so I know that's kind of a weird concept, um, but it's, it's what allows us to utilize some of them as antacids and things of that sort. Okay, now, another question that usually comes up is, do um, your bases have to be, um, or have hydroxides in the molecular structure in order to be a base? Okay, and the answer to that is no. Um, however, most strong bases are going to have the hydroxide in the structure. Now, the point that you have to think about here is that in order for something to be able to behave as a base, um, they have to basically either uh, accept hydrogens or they have to increase uh, the hydroxide ion concentration solution. So um, if we had something like this, okay, um, we would end up with NH4 plus and OH minus potentially, right? Okay, so in this case, we've increased our hydroxide ion concentration. The NH3 has accepted um, the hydrogen from the water molecule. So this is behaved as the acid, this is behaved as the base. Okay, now um, NH3 is a very weak base. Okay, and of course, H2O is a relatively weak acid, okay, but some of this transfer will happen. Okay, so um, just because a base doesn't have a hydroxide ion in the structure doesn't mean that it can't actually behave as one. All right, so um, also guys, ammonia or your NH3 that we see here, this is a weak base, it's a very common weak base. Please make sure you add that to your memorization list. So now returning back to conjugate acid-base pairs. So now that we kind of understand how to use the uh, relative strength list, um, from our table that we saw a few slides ago, we can go ahead and analyze um, which of the species present in each of these examples are going to behave as an acid, which one's going to behave as a base, and subsequently um, determine our uh, conjugate acid-base pairs. Okay, so guys, if we go ahead and we look on the list, um, we, we look at acetic acid, we look at NH3, acetic acid is much higher on the list in terms of acid strength, so it's going to behave as an acid. So the, the opposite of that, of course, is going to be if you're lower on the list um, in terms of acidic character, you'll be more likely to behave as a base. So in this case, NH3 is going to behave as a base. So remember, bases accept um, protons. So my acetic acid here is going to give my proton to my NH3. Okay, so remember, my conjugate base right, is going to be the leftovers from the acid, and my conjugate acid is going to be the new complex or the new substance formed when the base picks up a proton. 
Okay, so NH4 plus is going to be produced because this NH3 is going to take on that proton from the acid. Okay, and this is going to be my new conjugate acid. And of course, my acetate ion is going to be my conjugate base because it's the leftovers after this acid gives away its H plus. Okay, so we can apply this same concept down here. So HF is going to be our acid. H2O in this case is going to be our base. Now, how do we determine that? Once again, we're familiar with the list. So even though HF is not a strong acid, it's a stronger acid than water. So um, acid is, the acid is going to transfer its proton over to the H2O. That's going to produce H3O plus and F minus. Okay, so it's going to be my conjugate acid because it's the product of picking up a proton. And uh, F minus is going to be my conjugate base because it's the leftovers after the acid has given away its um, H plus ion. Okay, so this is how we can utilize um, the understanding of relative strengths of acids and bases uh, to further determine our conjugate acid base pairs. Some of you may have noticed that depending on the situation, water has either behaved as an acid or a base. Okay, and that is a unique feature of some molecules, water being one of them. Um, the fact that they can behave as an acid or a base depending on um, the other substances it's being exposed to. Okay, so water, guys, has obviously um, hydrogen, so it has the potential to potentially give away H pluses and behave as an acid, but it also has sites on it um, that could potentially pick up H plus ions and behave therefore as a base. Okay, so depending on um, what it's in contact with, that's going to dictate whether it behaves as an acid or a base. So if we look at this problem, we have HCl, which is one of our strong acids. So if it's one of our strong acids, our water in this case is going to be a base. Okay, so the transfer is going to occur in this uh, manner. Um, so water is behaving as a base in this situation. Okay, so NH3, guys, we know that it is a um, weak base. Um, and in this context, uh, H2O is going to be the thing behaving as our acid. Okay, so again, guys, um, knowing that chart, being comfortable with the relative positions of everything is going to help us. So in this context, um, H2O would transfer over its uh, one of its H pluses, producing the hydroxide and the ammonium ion. Okay, so these are just uh, ways in which water can uniquely behave. There are other substances that can um, behave in an amphiprotic matter manner. However, uh, water is the most common in terms of acid-base chemistry. Okay, so guys, when water is just kind of hanging out with itself, um, basically if we just have a glass of pure water, uh, an autoionization process is actually going to occur because um, remember, we've just talked about how uh, water can behave as an acid or base. Well, what happens is that uh, when water molecules interact with each other, um, sometimes some of them will give away H pluses and some of them will accept them. And we end up with a solution that has H3O plus and OH minus ions present. Okay, um, so, so basically we've produced... Um, some hydronium and some H3O plus ions uh, when we just leave a, a glass of water, a beaker of water on, on a bench top. Now, if we were to go ahead and write an equilibrium expression for this, okay, we would write H3O plus, okay, times OH minus, right, and that's going to be equal to KW, which is going to be the equilibrium expression, ex expression for the uh, autoionization of water. Okay, now in this case, notice we leave out water in our expression. Water is a liquid, so of course it doesn't get included. Okay, now at 25 degrees C, um, a uh, container of pure water with a pH of 7 is going to um, correspond to uh, this equation here. Your Kw, your constant, is always going to be 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14 molar um, at 25 degrees C um, and a pH of 7. Okay, so if that's your pH, if that's your temperature, um, you can go ahead and utilize this equation to um, figure out relative concentrations of H3O plus and OH minus ions. Okay, um, now notice uh, at this temperature, these should be um, equal in terms of concentrations. Um, however, obviously, if we adjust the concentration somehow, um, obviously, there's going to be a change in the other uh, ion present. Okay, so um, this equation can be utilized to kind of help guide us uh, in some practice problems as well as uh, some various different types of temperature problems. So let's go ahead and let's practice this. Okay, so excuse me, this should be the negative 13th. Um, so at this point, they've given us um, Kw uh, for a specific situation. So 60 degrees C. So notice we're not at 25 degrees C, so they've had to give us a new Kw. Okay, but Kw is still going to be equal to our hydronium ion concentration 
times I hydroxide ion concentration. So in this case, since we're at 60 degrees, we're going to be having a Kw value of negative 13. Okay, so we know that temperature affects our equilibrium um, positions. Uh, we've already talked about that process uh, in the last unit, so this should be no surprise. Okay, so um, what they want us to do here is to calculate our um, concentrations of our H plus and our OH minus at equilibrium. Okay, so it, very easily, if we were to just address this or treat this as X um, is equal to our H3O plus and our OH minus concentration, okay, we can easily plug this into our KW expression as the following. Okay, take the square root of both sides, and X is therefore going to equal 3.2 times 10 to the negative 7 molar. Okay, and so that will correspond to the concentration of both H3O plus and OH minus um, at 60 degrees. Okay, now let's say we have a problem where they want us to find out the H plus concentration for a solution um, with this particular KW, um, but they've given us the hydroxide ion concentration. Okay, so somehow that's been adjusted. So if we take our equilibrium expression that we um, have up here and we solve for our H plus ion, we're going to end up with the following equation. And if we go ahead and plug in our variables, we get the following equation. And if we plug these into our calculator, we'll get 5.6 times 10 to the negative fifth molar as the concentration of our H plus or hydronium ions, however you want to look at it. Okay, so um, just remember guys, KW, this, this is representing the autoionization process of water. It is determined by various temperatures. Okay, so 25 degrees C is what we taught it as, but if we do anything at a different temperature, um, I will give you the new KW. So at 25 degrees C, I expect you to know the previous equation and the constant. Um, at any other temperatures, I will give you additional values.